gladly pay you by the hour for a minute or so so you can sign off on the towers where they'll piss on your home and if you feel like you're just powerless to answer them no it's cause you are they'll gladly pay you by the hour for a minute or so so you can sign off on the towers where they'll piss on your home and if you feel like you're just powerless to answer them no it's cause you are it's cause you are they'll gladly stagnate a living wage snap the chains bury it Labor slaves in rusty cages dragged behind a chariot Led by Mr. Racial Jungle, Joseph R. Iscariot Fighting over scraps as they barrage us all with variants And buzzfeed clickbait straight until we're paralyzed Trying to distract us from the concentration camps That Joe had swore he'd close but only chose to amplify Where they got fifty-something kids in cages made for five to occupy and no, she hasn't seen the camps, but Harris swears they're paradise. She tells us the facilities are safe, and that right down to the women, they are regularly sterilized. Then she throws her head back, and she proceeds to laugh that sort of heartless cackle you'd expect from someone working steadfastly on behalf of the virus and a congress full of parasites. And where was I? I was busy cashing every blue check, demonstrating plainly all the narratives expected from the verified. I was busy breeding verbal leeches by the terabyte. Train them to exsanguinate the wealthy while they sleep at night. Bleed the oil barons dry and barren, say they showed us how to share and now we share alike. Tell them I contracted rabies from a feral mic. Now I'm just another species losing sleep to noise pollution and these glaring lights Forced to change its habits and adapt to just survive But now it's safe to say that some of us are thriving in the moment Throwing shit on presidential homes beneath the Paris skies So if you feel like you're just powerless, I guess you bought the lie But I can tell they're petrified of our collective might Cause I can hear those gentrifiers weeping at the sight of our collective rights And I only can imagine the intensifying fear of knowing revolution's near And all that's left to do is simply wallow in the thick anticipation of a rabbit bite And baby one day you can ask your leaders just what that was like before you grab a slice <laughs> So if you think you're powerless, allow me now to change your mind Honey, if you think you're powerless, allow me now to change your mind See, they'll pay you hourly, tax them each apart And build a shining tower out of loopholes and cards And tell you that you're powerless to keep you in the dark Because you aren't, because we aren't You see, they'll pay you hourly Tax the meat apart and make you build a shining tower out of loopholes and cards Where they'll tell you that you're powerless to keep you in the dark Because you aren't Because we aren't False alarm I thought that help was here But it was my own reassurance Bouncing round a hundred thousand times in my own ecosphere if every time you speak you keep it off the record, consequently you can keep your record clear. And if you mute the speech that shakes your frail beliefs, you only seek to insulate your image and continue down the stream in the direction clout and credit steers. Directly from your mouth into am I the asshole Reddit ears. Directly back into the greasy pockets of some Gates Foundation financiers. And then directly back into the frantic final thoughts of early trial Neuralink volunteers Staring at the numb and mumbling vacancies where recently it then appears 
half of whom are glitching with the memory stuck on pause and half have zero fucking clue just who they are or why they're here it's been said that fear is all we have to fear but that was back before the basil spear condenser came along distilling concentrated fear that's diamond pure crystal clear oppressor strong and woven into every single article you read and song they let you hear and then Elon heard that Jeff enhanced our fears by 86% and he said hold my beer and not a single sheep among the herd but turn their head or say a word cause they were all too busy begging for the shears begging for the muzzle happy just to guzzle feed and watch a screen for all their years man to each his own can't afford a home but they'll let you have your cozy little ecosphere we're there among your own devices you can break the seventh seal overthrow the oracles and slay the seer all the tomes were burned and all the lips were seared shut your eyes and all our lives just disappear now blink them twice welcome to your ecosphere Legend says that Hercules swept Cerberus right off his feet and effortlessly set him down softly as a songbird. Atlas kept the world upon his back and every day wondered whether he could stand it any longer. And Tara Reed came out to say the man they tried to label the messiah of morality was really just another rapist. And I don't intend to hesitate when asked who was the stronger. Tara, like Assange, knew that carrying the truth would be the hardest labor. Tara knew that her assailant wasn't gonna make us any safer and knew he's just the type of man to hand a decent foreign leader US printed walking papers and knew he'd be relentless and aggressive in the war he'd wage upon her very character that his attempts to weaken and degrade and embarrass her would be her only compensation but I strongly doubt that anyone could ever have foreseen the stream of hate that came from quote unquote progressives and the self-styled titans of survivor advocation. So if you really think there's something to be gained out of sharing your pain with the world, you are sorely mistaken. The Biden team just drug their feet addressing Tara's allegations until they had a decent list of smears, then they aired them out on every station. And it turns out no one wants to hear the truth of who they praised as being worthy of such bloated liberal celebration that no one wants to really know the person they've so valiantly defended even when it meant they had to gloat and shit all over someone braver than they'd be if given the occasion now cue the faceless comment squad invasion cue those fuckers crawling out the woodwork to come analyze the way you wore your hair and what you wear like your appearance waves your rights or that somehow you're the reason for your situation Somehow they've decided you should bear responsibility for what such monstrous men insist on doing. Somehow they're deluded by the empty, hypocritical, and useless fucking platitudes that bastard keeps on spewing. And I think it's very telling that the best of their excuses when they try to come and justify our president's abuses is a hearty butt Trump. In which case I'll remind you that you never saw the news attempt to sell us Donald Trump like he was morally upstanding or a decent human. But when Joe says something bigoted or ogles someone's little kid, CNN says isn't this refreshing Biden's like a mix of JFK and FDR with all the finer parts of Harry Truman. <laughs> Christ I know that they don't think that we're the brightest but at least pretend we got a couple lumens yourself if you have ever questioned what they fed you or do you just shut your eyes and then consume it and now ask yourself if you ate every one of biden's lies under guise of harm reduction and the promise of a slight improvement 
And now imagine long ago that Biden chose to show you who he really was by traumatizing you for his amusement. Now imagine that you watched him touch a Bible with those filthy hands and then assume the power of the highest seed in all the land of knowing your attacker wields a global coalition born of three-letter agencies who'll make a life's mission out of trying to discredit you through lies, damn lies, and collusion. Big tech is never gonna separate from our surveillance state. Fuck's sakes, they're just a breath away from total fusion. So there will come a time where even if you see the light, your voice will never reach the sky through all the bots and all the noise pollution. So trust us when we tell you that the masking of abuses is perhaps this country's oldest institution. And I know nothing nobler than facing it in honor of the truth when you know that the people holding power have been neutralizing truth since there was wet ink on the Constitution. So know that Tara's truth is something crucial to the movement. And if you see yourself a partner to the revolution, Help this country see through all the baseless propaganda through the crux of Joe's illusions and recognize that Tara Reid gave everything she had so she could tell us what the truth is. Recognize the decent thing to do when someone bears their soul and shows their bruises is not to ask for context or offer up your own solutions. Your job is just to listen with an honest mind and put yourself on Tara's side a moment so you understand the path she chooses that there is no instant fame worth the dragging of your name and if that's what you think you've a lot to learn about the kind of facts the mob can handle and the kind that it refuses you've a lot to learn about the news and all its many uses guess you've yet to learn the truth the news will serve as fruit from which they've squeezed out all the juices and we all eat the husk and just pretend it's full of nutrients and isn't really useless but the jaws of our ability to yield accountability are absolutely toothless. So don't you kid yourself that any lips are being loosened. They won't ever tell us where the bodies are or show us where the proof is. It's on you to recognize the lechery our president so regularly oozes. It's on you to muster up some honesty and ask yourself how Biden won your trust, but it's America that loses. Open up your eyes and learn to recognize the bruises. Open up your eyes and learn to recognize the bruises. and neutering their visa maxes topple congress off their axis mobilize the homeless give them axes call it praxis chop a couple limbs off the legislative branches we'll show you the difference between air as a human right and guaranteed oxygen access octogenarians who barely know what day it is are culling countless citizens while sitting on a dais made of ignorance that was built on the graves of the slaves made to labor for its self-declared significance and all to build a congress full of millionaires who make their fortunes insider trading while they shit on all the indigent so i got a bone to pick with our leaders and i'll start with the ligaments pick right through the muscle dig the marrow out and serve it to the unhoused millions living in their minivans or watching their belongings get evicted from their tenement I have a dream where we breach the walls of Congress and just let them in. And what happens next will survive in only text, cause there won't be any evidence. There will only be that heavy kind of feeling that pervades a space where there has been a reckoning and you can feel its remnants. Let any man who enters seeking power know that those who came before him suffocated on their eminence. That there once was a seal on the wall, but we quartered it and scattered all the pieces that it might prevent its semblance. And so we end the great experiment. 
We'll take all your billions. Leave you two coins. Oh, Politics and Survival. I'm your host, Tara Reed. Thank you for joining us today on our normal time and, and for all of you that tuned in when I had Maria Butina um, on last week. So um, as everyone is aware, um, there's been um, some more uh, activity with the conflict, um, the proxy war that the US and NATO is fighting um, via Ukraine against Russia. And uh, after the bridge explosion, um, in Crimea this weekend. Um, this morning, Kiev woke up to um, several missile strikes. We're going to talk to a journalist who has been an investigative journalist whom I really admire and um, I've had on the show before, but she brings such a great perspective because she's on the ground. She's on the ground in a lot of conflicts, including Syria and others. And re most recently, she attended the referendums um, that were taking place in eastern Ukraine and really can give a good perspective. So I'm asking my audience, um, is particularly in the West, that so much news is censored and every single news article referred to the referendums, the elections that were held in Eastern Ukraine for citizens to join Russia. They were called sham um, referendums. And that was the language used by CNN and Washington Post, all the legacy corporate media in the West. And there's a different view and we need to look at different lenses and to be um, objective as we disseminate this information, because there's a strong uh, push for citizens in America and in the, in the EU to try to, um, you know, give consent um, while they manufacture our consent about this uh, war, this proxy war that they're fighting against Russia. But there's another view and there's another way to look at this. So I, without further ado, I want to thank Vanessa Bealy for joining us and to give us that view. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Tara. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everything you're doing to get, you know, at least diverging views out there and, and sort of crack open this one view, one party, one line, one war or multiple wars all being uh, having consent manufactured for them by the media. Yeah, it's very important that we we hear um, different perspectives. And right now, I want to give people a view because we're hearing from journalists that are not on the ground. I want to hear from a journalist who's on the ground, right? Yeah. You, Ava Bartlett, are true heroes, and um, you know all of the people that are down. Patrick Lancaster, and soon we're going to have Wyatt Reed on our show, who went through his own harrowing experience, as you know, mm. uh, this weekend. But we'll get to that. But um, you were on the ground during the elections when. Eastern Ukraine <laughs> deciding whether or not to join um, the Russian Federation. So tell us a little bit about um, how you came to be an impartial observer and and what that journey was like. Um, well, I, th I mean, I was invited to be an impartial observer by an organization uh, in Serbia. So there were a number of delegates that went uh, from Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro. I also have to say that a couple of those guys were actually prevented boarding the plane in Serbia. So, so the, the censorship, if you like, or the prevention tactics um, to, to, to disallow independent observers to, to simply observe the election. And I think there's two points that I need to make straight away. First of all, this was not Putin's election. This was not Russia's referendum, as it's constantly described as in Western legacy media. It was a referendum organized by the people of Donbass and the refugees from Donbass on Russian territory um, for the people of Donbass to not only gain their sovereignty from Ukraine, but also to now accede to Russia, because 
This territory, the Donbass territory, basically Zaporozhye, Kherson, Donetsk, and Lugansk, have been targeted by an ethnic cleansing campaign. There is no other way to describe it, a genocidal campaign by the neo-Nazis and the Ukrainian ultranationalists that were put in place and empowered after the um, Washington Victoria Newland organized coup in 2014. So this entire conflict, if you like, has its origins. It goes way back, actually, but let's start from 2014 because people kind of assume this war just started in February 2022, and they don't look at the context and they don't look at the history. And to be fair, the media doesn't give them the context, of course, as it doesn't with, with Syria, with Libya, with Iraq, etc. other than the context they want you to have, right? And, and this is an important point to make. So the idea was for over 100, 133 um, observers to go to Moscow. And from there, we basically radiated out into Russian territory. So we went to refugee areas inside Russian territory. So people that had fled um, even from 2014, 2015 onwards. But of course, <laughs> the majority had come after February uh, 2022 when the conflict had escalated. Um, and then after seeing those refugee centers, um, we went into the Donbass itself. I was centered in Donetsk, but other delegates went to Kherson, um, Zaporozhye, Lugansk. So effectively, the whole area of Donbass was covered, and there wasn't a single um, <coughs> ballot that wasn't observed by a team of those independent observers. And as I said, they came from all over the world, from Africa, Togo, Ghana, South Africa, Iceland, Denmark. Um, I, there were very few countries that were not represented. Yeah, that's interesting. And I did see um, when I was watching some of this that some of the um, delegates complained about being targeted or censored on social media by NAFO trolls and, and stuff. Can you speak to that? Did that happen? Or Well, I mean, effectively, as soon as we arrived, as I mentioned to you, even before we arrived, a couple of the delegates, um, there was, I believe, there was one German delegation that wasn't actually part of the observers but they were in the Donbass area. They wanted to come to the Donbass area anyway. And as you know, the referendum was brought forward from November um, to September, the end of September. So this uh, delegation basically clashed with the referendum and Germany actually threatened them with prosecution if they went to the referendum. So they immediately returned back to Germany. But as soon as um, the German um, observers landed, Germany started to threaten them with losing their jobs. There was one CEO of an energy company in Germany who since has lost his job um, and has now taken asylum in Russia. Um, but there was at least one delegate from, I think it was from Montenegro, um, and he was prevented boarding the plane in Serbia so as I said, the threats began even before people were on the ground and were observing the referendum. But as soon as people realized they couldn't prevent it and that we were on the ground, then the media in their respective countries started to smear them and censor them. I mean, I was with a really lovely lady from a Hindu lady from India um, and the Hindu Times started attacking her almost immediately that her, she set foot um, in in Donbass, so you know the 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 attacks on us. <coughs> sorry, I brought a call back from Russia. Oh. The attacks on us um, from the beginning um, of our job there, which was to observe the referendum, mm -hmm. um, were extraordinary, and they only increased once we left, and once, of course, the results of the referendum came in. And, and, you know, um, so this was tough, I mean, for people to go and e just even be an impartial observer, because there is such 
um, the Kiev re regime has such a stranglehold on trying to keep out what's really happening and and the violence that's taking place against um, you know people that are living there um, mm. considered Russian nationals I, I, and that's not even really the right word I mean I, I just I, be, I guess but what I wanted to get from you too is was what was the mood of the people as they came into polls because you heard the disinformation coming from the West they were saying things like um, they were <coughs> Oh, they were, you know, ridiculous claims anyway. But on the ground, you were hearing um, direct reports that people were happy um, to yeah. vote and pleased. And Ava Bartlett did a great job of sharing some videos. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you personally saw um, at the polling stations or around in the area and, and their general mood? Well, I mean, considering that in Donetsk, we had overhead for the whole time we were there, the sound of incoming missiles and air defense intercepting those missiles. So mm -hmm. the entire area of Donetsk was under attack effectively for the whole time that people were coming out in their droves to vote. So that's how important it was for these people to come and express their desire to be reunified with Russia. Um, and even on uh, Russian territory in the refugee areas, there was a feeling of um, that, that this should have happened a lot sooner. You know, if you remember back in 2014, there was a referendum for their independence. They asked Russia to be able to accede to Russia, and it was refused at the time. But that referendum in 2014, they invited the UN and the OCSE to come and observe that referendum. They refused, right? So the UN doesn't have a leg to stand on when now it's complaining that the referendum went ahead and it wasn't invited to observe. It was already invited back yeah. in 2014. But the majority of those people even said to me, you know, this goes back to 1991 when our region was, was basically given um, to Ukraine a, a kind of genetically engineered state at the end of the Soviet Union. And of course, the, the downfall of the Soviet Union was also engineered by the West, by the US in Afghanistan, not forgetting that either. Um, <laughs> and not forgetting Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was instrumental um, in, in the instrumentalizing of the, of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, had also written the Grand Chess Board in 1997 outlying um, the need to balkanize Russia, to, to weaken Russia, to protect US supremacy, mm -hmm. right? But coming back to the people, and yeah, you're absolutely right, Eva has done, I mean, absolutely outstanding work interviewing people on the ground. It's what she does, an absolutely perfect job of. She's amazing, my hat off to her completely. She's been through some really terrible situations there to actually get these interviews out to get this information out to people. Amazing what she's done, really. I mean, you know, I love her to pieces. Um, but the people that I spoke to said exactly the same thing. I mean, when they were asked, were you coerced into voting? You know, one of the biggest memes in the West is they were, they, they were voting at gunpoint. Well, right. no, the gunpoint is coming from Western Ukraine. It's coming from Kiev. It's coming from the Ukrainian ultranationalists who have been bombing them, torturing them, detaining them, executing them, sniping them, putting them on kill lists for eight, for eight years, including 300 children on that kill list, Yeah. right? And that kill list is a NATO kill list. It's mm -hmm. backed by the US. There are actual US citizens, CIA operatives behind that kill list. So it's not a Ukrainian kill list. That's just the cover story for it. It's backed by NATO. You know, I contacted a journalist about, about this. I won't say who it is publicly, but they mm. countered with, well, there's no proof this kill list um, is linked to Westerners or um, there's no, there's not, it's been covered in such a sloppy way. So my question, I guess, back to that journalist is, it's not being covered at all. So what are you talking about? And um, first of all, and what would you say to some to a Western journalist stating that 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 it's um, that 
it's there's no definitive proof that it's um, linked to Westerners or or such things, um, because you know I, I disagree with that. But I yeah, want to hear I know. From you yeah, no, I mean I would recommend that they go and read George Eliason's work from 2015. George Eliason is yes. an American citizen, an American journalist on the ground in Ukraine for more than 10 years. So he was there before 2014. Um, he's living in the Donbass area. He has a, a whole heap of experiences of um, cruelty and atrocities committed by the Ukrainian forces against the people of Donbass. He's written about um, a guy called Joel Harding, who has a background in uh, special forces in the States connections to the Pentagon, to CIA, who effectively pre-2015 established the cyber war um, rooms, if you like, in Ukraine. And he is responsible for the cyber warfare against the people of Donbass and against anyone that, that stands in solidarity with those people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that is all... Um, it's, it's all been notated by George in his articles. So I recommend going to his articles of 2015. I can send you the links. Right. And there you will see the first footprint of the West, of NATO, on these kind of kill lists. Mm -hmm. There's another kill list, by the way, in the UK called Molfar Global, which was established in the UK. It's actually listed at Company's House in the UK. And it effectively has a very similar orc, you know, the, the, the derogatory term they use to describe Russians. Mm -hmm. um, it has an orc list where it, it lists with photo and bio of all the people that they consider should be hunted down um, in Ukrainian territory, right? So it's not as if the Myrotvorets list is the only one out there. But it's certainly the first. I mean, it was established way back in 2014, 2015, right? It has more than 300 children on that list. And journalists um, have died on that list. And they yeah. put a horrible um, message across <laughs> when it's deceased. Absolutely. And even Eva, because I remember when Louise Mensch, um, mm -hmm. a former British MP, actually mm -hmm. doxed her on Twitter to the special forces of Ukraine. And two days later, or even one day later, her hotel, the same hotel that Wyatt was at, by the way, was bombed um, in Donetsk. And that's not a coincidence. No. no way that's a coincidence. And any journalist who is denying the existence of this kill list is complicit in war crimes, in my opinion. There you have it. And well said. And you know, I, I, I was looking before you came on today just to pull one Western media story about it. And the only thing I could find was the one I've already shown my audience, which was the NBC. And they didn't even talk about it really. They, they did a hit piece on Ava Bartlett. It was NBC. Mm. And, they, yeah. and instead of talking about her being on the hit list and in danger, they literally just did a terrible, you know, dissemination yeah. of, of- I mean, of, but, but this is so, what they do. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you further on that. Are you, you're on that kill list as well as um, the next guest that we have coming on in a few, few minutes, uh, Wyatt Reed, mm. but what has, have you gotten any support, safety or concerns from your home country government or any, any kind of, <laughs> no. Any, no. no, 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 no. I mean, the last time I went back to the UK, I was detained as a Russian agent for six hours and had my phones wiped so i think the chances now of my country doing anything other than supporting the kill list against me and supporting any sanctions against me as they did against um graham phillips of course mm -hmm. you know who's who's risking his life in the donbass reporting on the situation there and the british government without any legal process has sanctioned him and frozen his assets in the uk we are living in such a lawless society right now where the predator class in the West is effectively just quite happy to put us on an assassination list. It's quite happy if we're killed. It's quite happy if we're in prison like Julian Assange. It's quite happy if we're censored and arrested or detained, 
or prevented right. from ever coming home again. You know, this is what they want. They want us silenced. They want us in, in fear as, as yeah. well. Fear and silence. Um, because, you know, you take away safety and connection and you take away everything from a human being, mm -hmm. right? That's, yeah. so that's yeah. the tactic. Um, predator class is a, is a word I like better than elite um, because elite <laughs> makes them sound kind of cool. Predator yeah. class tells them what they are. And yeah, exactly, um, or parasite to... class, one of the two. Yeah, but, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, you have dealt with a lot of uh, suppression and with censorship. So I'm glad you talked about that. And you brought up a point I wanted to bring us forward to the um, explosion of the Crimean Bridge um, that just happened. Um, there were all kinds of memes, right? <coughs> Celebrating this and, and making fun of it. And one thing that really struck me was NPR did a piece yesterday. I think it was yesterday, the day before. And were basically twisting themselves in a pretzel, so to speak. And this is NPR is kind of like, you know, it's public broadcasting. So it's like BBC in, in England or whatever. Mm. But um, they were saying how that the memes were necessary for the Ukrainians um, to process what they're doing. And they're, they're as old as Soviet times. And they were just like making all these excuses for the fact that these people were celebrating that three civilians were killed in a terrorist attack. And I, I just kind of wanted your, your um, perspective on what you saw um, after uh, that explosion took place on that infrastructure. Well, I mean, having, you know, covered events in Syria and having lived here for three years and worked here for seven years, um, it doesn't surprise me at all that the West is glorifying what is effectively either a suicide bomber or an outright um, ter terrorist attack, right? Um, but I think what for me, this is part of a very worrying trend where Nazism is being normalized in front of our eyes, mm -hmm. right? For in, in 2016, all of the media were united in admitting there is a Nazi problem, there is a fascist problem in Ukraine. Now that has completely disappeared. NYT is uh, showcasing Azov battalion fighters hugging their wives. They're being met with in uh, Congress, I believe, right. Mm -hmm. right? They're probably being given a platform on various media outlets in the West. Mm -hmm. um, the Daily Mail ran an article the other day describing how Ukrainians were chasing, hunting collaborators, their word, like pigs and killing them. We yeah. then have an Azov Nazi publishing on his Telegram account a video of uh, civilians with their hands tied being executed and thrown into a sandpit. He then changes the wording of his Telegram post because it received too much attention on social media to claiming that they found it on an occupier's mobile phone. Well, too late, Sonny Jim. We'd already seen what you put and what you were crowing about on your Telegram channel. And I saw Yahoo um, News today putting something out about um, an Azov battalion fighter is about to have a baby with his wife. You know, this is like a complete normalization process for child killers to turn them into, you know, family men. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just extraordinary. The Sun in the UK running wanted posters for Putin you know, who would, who would mind if he's assassinated? I mean, we've, we've just entered into some hideous dystopian world where in Syria, Al-Qaeda and ISIS were being flaunted as rebels and democracy freedom fighters. And now we have Nazis, literal Nazis, being whitewashed and entertained in the halls of power in the West, right? We're training them in the UK. We're militarily training them in the UK. Mm. I mean, our grandparents must be, if, if they're still alive, they must be weeping. If mm -hmm. they're dead, God bless them, they must be turning in their grave. This isn't what they fought for. No. We didn't fight to have a world that is controlled by fascists and by Nazis and by terrorists and extremists of whatever ilk. Right, but this is what they're foisting on us. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It is. It is. It's. Um. It's. 
how, and in fact, they just, um, you brought up a really good point, um, several good points, but one of them was, <laughs> they just brought up a, a photo of a general with the Ukrainian military with a Nazi emblem. I mean, they don't hide yeah. it. They don't no. even hide it. No, I they're mean, proud they're, of it. They're, they're, they're proud just, of they're it. They're airbrush some of the Nazi uh, insignia off, and then they gave up airbrushing, right? Because, no, but I mean, the thing is now, they're literally, they're proud of it. They're not mm -hmm. even trying to hide it anymore. And, you know, by the way, for people to understand, when 2014 happened and you had the massacre in Odessa and the lesser known massacre in Mariupol, right? Um, <coughs> um, Bulgarians and Romanians and non-Ukrainian nationals, but living in Ukraine, who protested against the ethnic cleansing program against the Eastern Russian speaking communities were themselves detained and executed and tortured. Mm. Zelensky has been running a program of disappearing his opposition, of persecution of the Communist Party inside, so of his political opposition inside Ukraine, um, basically killing, murdering media that were not agreeing with his point of view. This has been ongoing for, for years, mm -hmm. right? Even pre-Zelensky, this has been going on. This isn't something new. But, you know, the way the West spins it, Russia's the bad guy, they're the good guy, but people fall for it again. Like, how many times in history do we have to have this narrative? It, it's know? true. It's true. I mean, it's it's um, it's kind of repeating itself and and feeding on itself. And Victoria mm. Newland is still in, in a position of power, yeah. even though she committed, <laughs> um, you know, in my opinion, she committed war crimes um, with her involvement in what she did. Julian Assange bravely exposed those war crimes, and for that, he's now in Belmarsh Prison yeah, and back back to be extradited to the U.S. As everyone knows, and he just was diagnosed with COVID, and he has a already has a lung disease. So. You know, um, you know, I'm really hoping that they drop the case um, against Julian Assange. Um, but, you know, um, and a lot, a lot of people would be happy if they did. But so far, that's not occurred. Um, you know, and more to your point about um, all of this, I wanted to ask, um, you know, as, as we move forward, because the conflict is escalating, they're already talking openly in the West about Number one, wanting regime change in Russia. Number two, they're talking about nuclear annihilation or limited use of nuclear weapons. Um, what, what is the atmosphere or mood when you were visiting a Moscow and then when you were also in Eastern Ukraine? What are other people saying that are living day to day that, you know, maybe not necessarily even that are politicians or journalists, but just every, you know, people living in this reality? What, what is the mood and what are the thoughts? happening well i mean in in donbass itself of course the mood was one of um jubilation and relief because for them as many of them describe to me and i'm sure why it will say the same thing many of them perceive russia as the motherland and as many of them said to me you know here russia is now protecting its children it can now protect its children Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is another important point to make, at least in Donetsk. I didn't see any Russian soldiers. You know, when people talk about the occupation of the Donbass and people being coerced to vote at gunpoint, um, the soldiers that were there were from the DPR, the Donetsk uh, People's Republic National Defense, and the LPR, the Lugansk um, People's Republic National Defense, right? Those were the only soldiers I saw. And of course they were there. Why? Because the SBU has agents inside the Donbass. Mm -hmm. It can easily carry out an assassination or an attack on people coming to vote on the ground, right? So the soldiers are there for the protection of their own family members, their own neighbors, their own people. Mm -hmm. um, and also because, as I said, Donetsk was under attack from uh, Ukrainian artillery and military the whole day I was there. Right, so those soldiers are there to protect um, the civilians in Donetsk itself. Um, I didn't, in all the drive from the border to Donetsk, I didn't see. I saw Russian troops at the border, 
but once we were in Donbass, I didn't see them. So this idea of kind of Russia completely swamping the Donbass and occupying the territory there um, is also a massive exaggeration by the West to justify, of course, um, the Ukrainian war crimes against the people of Donbass. And I'm pretty sure um, Wyatt will also um, confirm that, as will Eva. Um, but as I've completely forgotten what the question was, sorry. Oh, no, I was asking to you about <laughs> Moscow. Moscow's kind of mood yeah. here about just um, the escalation of the Western, um, you know, rhetoric about nuclear. Yeah, rhetoric. I mean, most people I spoke to were fairly um, sober about the whole thing and just said, uh, as from a Russian perspective, they don't want to go nuclear. Again, you know, Putin's words were taken out of context. Because what he actually said and what he's been saying all along is if the West pushes us, we have no option but to respond. Mm -hmm. And at the weekend, they bombed, you know, one of the most important bridges for, for Russia and for Crimea. And so, of course, there was going to be a response. I mean, what do they expect? It's a terrorist attack on a civilian infrastructure, right? I, what is Russia going to do? It's not going to sit back and not respond. And this is the thing. Now the West is dealing with a country that can respond. And that's the difference. When it was bombing Libya and Iraq and Syria, and Afghanistan. Right, um, there was limited response because all of them are relatively weak nations. I'm not wanting to patronize those nations at all because in Syria the resistance here has been extraordinary but compared to Russia they don't have the resources they don't have the manpower to be able to respond in the way that Russia is responding to to Western hegemony and this is why you know we're in shock in the West because finally we have an enemy that is able to respond proportionately to the Western aggression and, you know, and that's interesting that you said that because, yes, we're, we're seeing the pushback happen in real time. And mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I wanted to get back to, I, I, because in my opinion, the media is complicit with with Western media, mm -hmm. um, with lifting um, this tension and this exasperating the, the move about nuclear war. I and mean, there's never any talk about peace or um, no. going to the table about trying to figure out something. Instead, it's just, you know, feeding the military industrial complex talking points constantly. And one thing, um, you know, that, that really got me was just um, how cavalier it was to just give misinformation about the Nord Stream 1 and 2. It was clear who made that attack. And in fact, um, just now, uh, there was some recent um, revelations that they know that it was NATO equipment that burst the pipeline. And this is this is getting, this will get out there. That according to um, Russian investigators. Now, Sweden is demanding that Russia not know or not participate, excuse me, in yeah. the investigation, right? Which is absurd, right? It's their, you know, their infrastructure. So this whole thing that Russia blew up its own pipeline was being floated in the media and they started to do it with the Crimean bridge, but the Ukrainians were too quick to claim to responsibility, take responsibility and, yeah. and, and crow. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about kind of that, about media ecosystem. They're kind of um, complicit with this, with all of this. Well, yeah, I mean, you talk about an ecosystem. Um, the media is the Petri dish of war crimes right western war crimes you know it ceased to be it's not fit for purpose it ceased to be a media all it is now um is a, a hit man or a hit woman for western power for western establishment for the western oligarchy um it is an extension of intelligence and security and military agencies mm -hmm. right yeah. um it has a script Mm -hmm. And it effectively um, chooses the evidence to fit the script. And that's basically what they do these days. And it's copy paste. So they all take it from, from Reuters or AP, basically. And then they mix it up a little bit and they spread it around. And that's it. Well, you know, yeah, they don't do journalism. That. I mean, right. I was so shocked this morning to see the BBC journalists actually at the front lines, literally at the front lines. 
I was kind of laughing because I'm like, oh, I bet he didn't expect that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I bet he thought he was quite fine with yes. his nice little green screen or whatever it was behind him. And, you know, yeah. BBC don't get in front lines. They don't get dirty, yeah. you know, and except, of course, for um, what's his name? Jeremy Bowen lying on the ground while the woman's looking at him like, what are you doing? Why are you lying on the ground? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I saw that photo. That was funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's really extraordinary. I And, you know, I just got a message, by the way, um, that Wyatt will be joining us probably. Ah, one cool. Day. So before we get to to him joining us, and who knows how long that process will take, because, you know, <laughs> technology. Oh, yeah. I, I wanted to um, get back to the referendums for one second, because we kind mm -hmm. of left our audience hanging with the with the rest of the story. They, they voted. And so talk a little bit about the results and, and how that was, you know, and the mechanics of that, just for a second, if you could, just to kind of complete that. Yeah, thought. sure. Well, I mean, in Donetsk, I think, um, I mean, this is, I've, I've told this story many times, but it still makes me smile, was when we entered the counting, the ballot counting um, building, mm -hmm. I could hear as we were walking down the corridor, this da, 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 that and basically it was the woman taking the votes from the women that had gathered them all together put them in the big piles and then passed them on to her and mm -hmm. it was like the that 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 which means yes vote so out of 4000 votes that had been counted when i arrived there were four no's so four only yets. four yes hmm. yeah four yes to 4000 um that and the, the really lovely thing was the, was the smiles on all their faces. They were loving it. It was like the ballot party, you know. They, they were so happy because what people don't understand, this wasn't a vote to, to accede to Russia. This was a vote for survival. Right. This was a vote in memory of all the people who have been killed in Donbass, 14,000 people. This was for those people who didn't live to see this day, but they fought for this day until they died. This was for all the people that lost their legs and their arms, that lost their children, that lost their dad, that lost their sister in this conflict against them, right? Yeah. So th this referendum can't be boiled down into, oh, it wasn't a free and fair, democratic process that so many Western commentators are trying to kind of box it into because mm -hmm. you had to be there to really understand what this meant to the people on the ground that have gone through eight years and I can empathize with that in Syria it's a different situation but exactly the same thing in Syria when areas were liberated by the Syrian Arab army which was portrayed as you know, a disaster in the West. But for those people on the ground during that liberation process, mm -hmm. it was like they'd been released into heaven. And right. until you've been in that situation, you can't understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, how could you understand the 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 direness of, of listening, you know, of just having your homes bombarded every day by your own government? I mean, mm -hmm. I can't even imagine how horrible that must have been, um, to, you know, to experience the violence from the Kiev regime that they did, um, and the and and then just the ins insensitive, you know, hatred. Yeah. And, yeah the, um, so so now, as far as what you're doing, you're in Syria. You're back in Syria now. Are you going to be going back into eastern Ukraine, or are you going to be um, more reporting now from afar on what you're doing? No, I mean, I'm I'm hoping to get back. Um, I'm not quite sure when because it's going to start getting really, really cold. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'll probably try to get back in November if I can. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, I wanted to the audience. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and we have another special guest that we're having join us, um, an investigative journalist who has been with me before, who um, does he's an American <laughs> journalist, but he's independent and living. He was last time he was in Spain. And then he was in um, the Donbass region for a day, and he will talk about his experiences that, of what just happened. Um, so please, everybody, let's welcome Wyatt Reed. Hello, Wyatt. Hey, Tara. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. I know, I know both you and Vanessa are so busy, um, so I appreciate both your time to kind of educate the Western audience because I, I'd been saying to Vanessa, 
um, earlier in the show, we are so limited in what we're seeing now, especially with our teas being censored. And in Europe, you can't see the articles at all, but in the US, it's very difficult. And it's we're just now getting pounded with one narrative. Um, so you had something extraordinary happen to you, and I am so glad you are safe. And I'm gonna get emotional because I was so worried about you. <laughs> but Wyatt, could you describe to me what happened and to our audience? And I'm glad you're safe and I'm not gonna cry. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And that is very, very sweet of you to say. And honestly, you know, I, I wanna preface this by saying what I experienced was just a very, very minor taste of what the people that I have been talking to and interacting with every day have been experiencing for eight years. But on Saturday night, I arrived here in Donetsk and was here at the Donbass Palace Hotel for less than an hour and was met with an artillery strike directly on our position. Uh, the windows of this hotel were shattered once again I artillery strike, I believe a 155 millimeter strike from the Kiev regime forces hit uh, just across the way. And I will actually um, take the viewers to go uh, have a chance to see exactly the after effects of this, uh, of this attack by the Kiev regime. Um, we have a, a, a strike here, you can see the after effects uh it, this window has been shattered the glass has been taken out um this was the most minor effect of the strike that took place just 30 meters over in this direction i was outside when it happened i watched this artillery strike hit mm -hmm. our hotel uh i was about 100 meters away so i watched in front of my eyes a massive ball of flames and smoke uh, rose up at least three stories high directly in front of me. Uh, I was, as I said, about a hundred meters away. Um, I was blown away. I was petrified. I was terrified. Uh, it was like nothing I've seen or felt in my life. I crouched down in the corner and had glass, shattered glass from the buildings around me that was blown out by the pressure of the attack rained down all around me. I immediately posted the video. I, I started recording about five seconds after this blast took place, five to 10 seconds after it took place. I captured my reaction to this. I captured the smoke and the car alarms going off and the natural consequences of an artillery strike on a civilian area, uh, which is of course for the people that have been living here, then that's nothing new. This is what they've been enduring for eight years. But to me, it was very new. It was a extremely new experience, um, horrific, uh, breathtaking, something that I really don't wish upon anyone. Um, but this is, again, what has been happening here for eight years in a civilian area to a hotel that is known to host journalists. This is the third time in two months that this same block has been struck by the Kiev regime. It's a clear attempt to intimidate journalists to stop people from coming here. And while I don't want to necessarily say that this was an attack on me personally, I do find it bizarre that this strike took place within an hour of my arrival and within an hour of me communicating to somebody perhaps um, erroneously, perhaps, perhaps stupidly, uh, and telling somebody my location on WhatsApp, a, an application that is controlled by Facebook, a corporation that is totally loyal to the United States government, uh, my location was shelled. And um, it was horrific. And I am very grateful to be alive. As I noted in a post that went pretty viral on Twitter, it's now gotten about a quarter million views. I noted that if I had come back about 30 seconds earlier, I would have most likely been killed by the Kiev regime. So that was my immediate experience upon coming to Donetsk and the other journalists, the workers of this hotel, um, 
we, we, we formed kind of a bond of camaraderie after this and we kind of all hung out at the hotel lobby. Uh, we drank a little bit of whiskey and kind of tried to process this extremely traumatic event. And they told me, welcome to Donetsk. Uh, this is your baptism and you are now kind of a, a part of this and you understand what we've all been going through for eight years. Eight years, yeah. And, and what you just mentioned too um, was also you were put on the kill list, Ukrainian, the Ukraine military kill list um, about a week or two ago. So that was recent as well, wasn't it? Very recent. Um, this kill list, it's maintained by the Ukrainian government. It's created by a number of influential figures within the Ukrainian government, most notably Anton Garashenko, who's a an interior ministry advisor for the Kiev regime, a man who presents himself as uh, on the side of truth and justice, a man who uh, tries to portray his opposition as being terrorists, um, and a man who says that rather than being a kill list, this is a an information clearinghouse, a public service that uh, he is performing uh, on behalf of the Ukrainian people. Uh, it's nonsense, obviously. It's a kill list. It's used by the Kiev regime to not only by their border guards to to check and verify uh, who is and isn't allowed to come into the territory currently controlled by the Kiev regime, but it's also used in court proceedings. There have been hundreds of cases uh, in which people have been convicted mere, based solely on allegations that have been aired on this website. They accused me of legitimizing the occupation of Crimea and of, of the Donbass region uh, after having come here and spent a few days in this region uh, for having uh, witnessed firsthand the referendums that took place from September 23rd to 27th. Uh, it's a kill list that numerous people have been placed on, numerous Westerners, a um, number of sitting congressmen, I believe, are on it. Um, Roger Waters, the Pink Floyd guitarist, and obviously the greatest lyricist of that band by far have been uh, placed on this list for oh, voicing Stone. opposition or even yeah. Oliver Stone for he voicing opposition yeah. or even skepticism towards the Kiev regime, towards their end game, or even just things as simple as encouraging them to negotiate peace, which is ostensibly what uh, everyone in the West is supposed to want from this conflict. Right. Um, things as simple as, as asking, asking the regime to honor their agreements in Minsk one, Minsk two, we can get into this later. Um, these are sufficient to get people on this list. There are hundreds of children on this list. Um, 13 year old Faina, uh, I'm going to slaughter her last name, uh, Gastonova, mm -hmm. uh, 13 year old child from, uh, Lugansk, who was placed on this government-sponsored kill list for the supposed crime of asking the UN to intervene and to put an end to bloodshed that has been going on since 2014. It's a horrifying sight. If viewers want to take a look at it, I don't really recommend it because it's, it's like a shock gore. Yeah, it's it's horrible. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you, uh, as soon as you hop on, I'm sorry, my my headphones just died. I hope you guys can still hear me. Yeah, your your volume's gone a little down. So if you want to do something to get your um, microphone up, I can see you fine, but it's just your your audio's gone down. But we we had been talking to you, Vanessa about the military kill list while you adjust that. Um, the volume. Um, and uh, she's also on it as as well. Um. And there, and the UK government, we were discussing how the UK government has done nothing, but in fact, you know, it seems like they're supporting it. Has the US, um, anyone from the US government giving you any, um, especially after you almost being killed, um, any kind of support or anything, security, any, any kind of recognition or something that you, that your life is in danger while you're trying to do your reporting or nothing? No, no, they, I have not received any support from the U.S. Embassy, from the State Department. On the contrary, 
I have read a statement from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who says that anyone who has given support to what they frame as fake referendums uh, in these four regions was recently voted to realign with Russia um, will be subject to punishment will be uh, will will be will be subjected to whatever they haven't specified exactly what the penalties will be but they said any individual any entity whether that be individual or state based uh, yeah. will be subjected to punishment if we have um, help support these referendums. It's very vague. It's very intimidating. Well, well, very well, mafioso. Yeah, Let, let's go back. So referendum is, you're an impartial observer of an election process. So they're proposing to punish, but not saying what the punishment is and considering it support if you're an impartial observer. Right. So neither neither the term support nor the, the punishment has been defined. It's uh -huh. a very mafioso style threat. Right. I don't know what it, exactly what it means, uh, but they are they are threatening not only myself but a number of observers from across the world, from I believe around forty countries, mm -hmm. over a hundred observers, including members of the African National Congress of South mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, it, Extremely distinguished diplomats have been placed on this list, lawyers, human mm -hmm. rights activists, all number of people were, are, are apparently now going to be subjected to some as yet undetermined punishment. Uh, Mr. Sullivan has yet to explain exactly what that means. Uh, right. But I mean, to me, this is pretty typical of the response that we've received um, for the crime of journalism, for the crime of coming to this area and actually speaking with the people who, by the way, uh, everyone, and I mean everyone that I spoke to who said like, yes, I, I, you know, I, I will give an interview, expressed not just support for this position of like, let's realign with Russia as mm -hmm. we have been for most of our lives. We, we were aligned with Russia. Uh, right. We consider ourselves Russian. They they expressed some level of, many of them expressed some level of, 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 of discomfort with how long it had taken to get to this stage. They have been wanting to be a part of Russia for many years. And so I interviewed a number of people. I interviewed a woman and her 81 year old mother. She said that she had spent two weeks trying to track down her mother and her mother had spent two months in a basement in, in the Donbass. And she said only friends from Moscow helped us, not friends from Kiev. Right. Uh, I spoke to another elderly man in his seventies who just, and, and by the way, that, that, that interview I just described to you, I, it only lasted 45 seconds because they both broke down in tears and had to discontinue the interview. And, Another interview that I had with a 70 year old man from the Donbass, uh, he told me that his son is currently fighting uh, against the Kiev regime. And he said that I wish that these so-called journalists from the West would have to spend just one day in our shoes, because if they did, they would understand what is happening to us. And I kind of personally, feel the same way now, having been subjected personally to an artillery attack by the Kiev regime. Right. Uh, it's hard for me not to empathize with these people, understanding having been placed on a government kill list for the crime of journalism. It's hard for me not to empathize more and more with these people. So if the goal is to try to, to stop us from, from having sympathy, for our fellow human beings who have been subjected to this level of violence for so long, for nearly a decade now, I think it's backfiring. Uh, I certainly hope so, because uh, at this point, it's really hard for me not to feel uh, a level of camaraderie and kinship with the people here, having myself been subjected to what they've been going through for so long.
Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I want to go to Vanessa for a second because Vanessa, there's um, Wyatt touched on something that that you and I didn't get a chance to get into. You actually had a letter that an EU um, member wrote to have you sanctioned specifically for your work as an impartial observer. Could you talk a little bit about that? Who that <laughs> official was and and what's happened as a result? I uh, I mean, as I said, it's personal because uh, Natalie Loiseau is a MEP. Um, she's also a very close aide to President uh, Macron. Um, she has a very checkered, shadowy past. Um, I won't go into all the details, but the main point um, was that she abused her power to basically wage a personal vendetta against me. Why? Because I had exposed her role in basically facilitating the unlawful aggression by France, the UK, and the US against Damascus. I was in Damascus when Damascus was uh, bombed by the, um, the axis of evil, the, the French, the UK, and the US, after the Duma alleged chemical attack um, that has been proven not to have been carried out by the Syrian government by dissenting OPCW inspectors who were on the ground to carry out the investigation, but after the unlawful aggression. Um, and Loiseau was responsible for effectively selling the idea to the media that the Syrian government had carried out the chemical attack, that they had French intelligence to, um, to corroborate and substantiate her claims, and that as a result it was perfectly legitimate for France in particular to bomb Syria, to destroy there are chemical weapon um, labs which were proven afterwards by the OPCW to be a cancer research center, at least one of the places that was bombed. Um, and so I'd already sort of attacked her for this. I'd attacked her for her connections to the Al-Qaeda-linked White Helmets, to her, for her connections to the Syria campaign that ran the PR um, against the Syrian government for the illegal armed groups and for the White Helmets. And so as a result, um, I think when she figured out that I was one of the independent observers, she wrote directly to Joseph Borrell, the High Representative for Foreign Affairs at the EU, and demanded that not only should the independent observers be sanctioned, that I personally, my name, Vanessa Beely, should be um, subject to sanctions because I basically am an agent of President Putin and an agent of President al-Assad. I'm paraphrasing. She didn't actually write that, but she might as well have done. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, this was, this was effectively a, a personal vendetta. So they're trying to normalize sanctions against individual journalists, which is <laughs> extraordinary. Um, you know, you, you saw what happened in Canada. Um, <clears throat> with, uh, you know, uh, the truck driver and the protests that were going on regarding uh, COVID and they, the Canadian government went in and froze assets and froze governments. And then of course you have Alina Lip, who the German government, yeah. because she was reporting from Donbass, um, fro and just because she reported people that were happy that Russians were there protecting them, that piece of reporting got her um, a prison sentence threat of three years her mm -hmm. bank account frozen and her parents, which is <coughs> to me, she's an adult and her parents' bank accounts were frozen. And, and um, as a result, she's, she's not able to go back to Germany for a while, I would imagine. Um, I mean, her mother's you, in Russia, actually. Her mother came yeah. to Russia. Also. Okay. So are you hearing of other journalists like that? Because this is not getting through to the Western media or even independent media here, really. No one's talking about what you all are going through trying to tell the story but um do you see things um at least getting a little bit exposed or is it still completely suppressed where you are oh no it's completely suppressed or even worse than that it's celebrated mm -hmm. you know i mean i saw a number of the usual suspects putting out yeah great you know natalie loiseau's got it in for vanessa she's a strong leader etc no of course they're not gonna this is what they want you know mm -hmm. I mean, they've been smearing us for, for eight years, unsuccessfully, I have to say. Um, so for them, this is, this is manna from heaven that we might actually finally get shut down. You know, and I wanted to, um, first of all, say thank God for Wyatt's safety. But let's not forget that Murad Gashtiev, the RT uh, foreign correspondent, 
was right. targeted in Kherson, like literally the day before the referendum, his hotel was had a direct hit. His mm -hmm. cameraman was buried under rubble. They yes. had to dig him out. He survived. And the two people in the room next to Murad uh, were killed. Yes. So, you know, this... It's not, I mean, why it's absolutely right. Please be careful about your location because seriously, dude, the SBU are not kidding around. I, I am less worried by Al Qaeda than I would be by SBU. So please be careful. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I can just add, I, I made the mistake, I think, of communicating to one person via WhatsApp uh, my location. Yeah. One Don't single person via WhatsApp. <laughs> that yeah. I had made it to my current location. And apparently that was enough. Less than an hour later, we were struck by an artillery strike. So mm. uh, yeah, and I, I, I appreciate it. And I'm on the same team in terms of, you know, I, I am not communicating anything on WhatsApp <laughs> going forward. Um, no, yeah, and, I mean, it's better yeah. to use encrypted apps if you can at least. Or well, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it unless you have to for an emergency. Yeah. Don't do it because yeah. you know it's it's way too high risk there. Yeah. Um. So going forward, why, what is um what is on your uh? I, again, I don't want to give away what your <laughs> what your reporting is, but can you talk a little bit about about why you're there now after the um and and what you know what you're hoping to to do a little bit right? So I follow your work and whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, I certainly have no intention of telegraphing my punches, especially at this point. Uh, but if people want to follow along with what's happening on my Telegram, on my Twitter, I plan in the coming days, hopefully, to get a closer look at the hostilities to see what's happening, what it's like closer to the front. Uh, and I am plan on speaking with the victims of the Kiev regime strikes on these civilian areas. I uh, had a chance to speak with a woman who I know is a friend of all of ours, Eva Bartlett, who uh, got a chance to uh, to coordinate and interview a group of volunteers that go out and attempt to rescue dogs and cats from the front line. Um, basically just humanitarians, people who really, really kind of Feel this kind of kinship with animals, which I do personally. I'm a vegetarian, uh, and I think that's an extremely sweet thing to do. And uh, I, I, I'd like to speak with them as well. Um, so really, I'm, I'm trying to go out and show the human side of the victims of this eight-year-long uh, civil war. This attack on civilians, on on even animals that have been going on for so long. Uh, I'm, I'm here to show what the mainstream media won't. I'm here to, and I wish that I didn't have to, I, I want to say that, I want to get this clear. I wish that I didn't have to feel compelled to come here. I wish that mainstream media reporters would come out here and show the reality so that I didn't feel compelled to come here so that we didn't need people like myself and Vanessa uh, and Eva and, and, and others to come out here and show people the truth. But the unfortunate reality is that they're unwilling to show this because to show the reality on the ground would be to go completely against the narrative that we're spoon fed by mainstream media. It would totally undermine this narrative that they've been portraying for so long about these innocent officials, poor Zelensky, you know, poor multimillionaire Zelensky who rose from obscurity and now has hundreds of millions of dollars to his name, uh, po poor Nazis, poor Azov, you know, that, they, oh, they got, uh, they didn't even get captured, right? They got evacuated into Russian prison. Uh, you know, poor Adar, poor, poor Nazis, right? This is the this is where we're at. It's honestly kind of mind blowing, but uh, yeah. To, the, the, to me, it, it it it's we're living in kind of an Alice in Wonderland world where just truth is fiction, fiction is truth, up is down, down is up. 
Yeah. And Nazis are, are heroes. Nazis are partisans. And Russians, Russian people who lost over 20 million people defeating the Nazis are now Nazis. We live in just a total fantasy land in the West. Um, and I'll say coming here has been like a breath of fresh air to talk to normal people who understand what the what reality is, who, who do not buy into this farcical notion of, of innocent Ukrainian uh, regime. It, it's like a breath of fresh air. And, uh, you know, I, I wish that I wish that these mainstream media reporters would come here, but as Vanessa noted, they just won't. It's not in their interest and it's not going to pay their bills. Um, you know what, you're, you're, I'm just so relieved that you're safe and that you're able to do more reporting so that we can get some truth to this. And, and I wanted to check in with Reef. Reef, could we get some comments because we are live. We're live on um, Rockfin Rumble, Twitch. So if we get censored on YouTube, um, people can bounce around to other links and also Twitter. Um, and I think Facebook, as everyone knows, I deleted my Facebook um, account, but INN has one. Um, Reef, do we have questions and comments for Vanessa and for Wyatt? Do yes, we do. Um, okay, we see. have, um, what's the worst thing you've seen in this war? Um, that's from Jared Brown for either Vanessa or Wyatt, I think. Okay. So, okay. Um, well, whoever wants we'll to go first. With start with Wyatt. <laughs> well, I haven't been here terribly long. Uh, the worst thing that I've seen so far is just the artillery strike that almost took me out. Um, the worst things that I've seen have been the testimonies from the people that uh, have come to me wishing desperately that more people from the West would come and, and report on what they're saying. I don't, mm -hmm. me personally, again, I, I feel blessed. And, and this is something that I communicated in, in my reports from Saturday night, from the night of the strike. I feel extremely lucky in some way to have that be my experience because no one was injured. Thank God, no one was injured. Mm -hmm. I was a safe enough distance from when this strike hit to be able to see it, feel it, have the glass rain down around me, but not be hit by shrapnel. Mm -hmm. I feel extraordinarily blessed in that sense. I, I got my little taste of, of what it's like to be here and it was more than enough I think honestly, Vanessa will be able to probably shine a little bit better of a light on this than I will. But uh, the it's breathtaking and it's it's horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vanessa, Vanessa, can you uh, can you answer the? Yeah, I mean, um, probably I've seen. Um, because of the length of time I've spent in Syria, I've seen um, some pretty horrific things and heard some pretty horrendous testimonies here, many of which I haven't actually been able to repeat because I don't think people could take it, to be honest. Um, but I think for me, um, probably the most disturbing day um, when Eva was reporting from Donetsk was about um, two weeks ago and there was a direct hit on close to the marketplace in Donetsk and Eva was there and Eva like me you know we've been in some pretty hot areas we've seen quite a few things even more than me I mean she was in Palestine from 2009 onwards um, and we were together in Gaza in 2012 under the Israeli aggression but when she uh, witnessed the strike and described to me um, the dismembered bodies immediately after the strike where um, she saw a woman's torso, but that was all she saw. Mm -hmm. And there were just dismembered limbs scattered. And, you know, as I said, we've, we've both seen a lot, but and and we both we we know each other very well and i just knew that this had really hit her so hard um and we communicated through the day and it was incredibly tough for her 
Um, and it always reminds me of something that John Pilger wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, one of the greatest ever war journalists, one of the most honest, I, I, someone who was an inspiration for me, and he said, um, you know, when you've, when you've seen children blown apart by cluster bombs or their skin flayed by napalm, you just stop uttering the claptrap that people do in the West. As I said, I'm paraphrasing it, but you know, until you've seen this, um, I've seen many things here in Gaza, but there was something about that day that was just so evil. You know, people just at the marketplace, civilians, as Wyatt said, they're not targeting military installations. They're not targeting military front lines. They're deliberately targeting civilian areas, schools, marketplaces, crowded shopping areas, apartments, um, civil gathering places, civil society places, right? Um, I mean, the ballot counting station was bombed one hour after we left on the day of, of the referendum itself. Um, you know, so these are civilian targets. This is ethnic cleansing. This is the mass murder of civilians. Um, and it's so for me, that's... The Kiev regime. This is yeah. Not, yeah. And yeah. people need to, to know that. And, and people yeah, don't absolutely. know that the They do not know. Um, yeah. Okay, Reef, do you, do you have another, another uh, question or comment that you'd like to share? Um... I think there was one more um, that talked about um, they're asking how uh, you thought African leaders were reacting to uh, NATO going after Gaddafi. Um, Vanessa, do you have any gonna, thoughts gonna, on that? Vanessa and, and Wyatt, we'll just we'll start with Vanessa and go to Wyatt. Uh, sorry, can you just repeat the question? How? Yeah, how how you feel African leaders are are responded to um, like NATO going after Gaddafi? Um, if you have any thoughts, generally on NATO's actions uh, in Africa. And... Be, 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 yeah, the audience member must be referring to to the way the the West is threatening to sanction some African nations for how, how they see support Russia. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I yeah, got yeah. thrown I mean, back I, in I, history a little I, bit. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I don't know. <laughs> no, but, no, yeah. that's fine. Um, look, a lot of African leaders um, prior to, I think it was prior to the special military operation, there was a brilliant speech by the foreign minister of South Africa, basically laying out the fact that they are not imperialist stooges. You know, African nations have undergone imperialist projects, they've suffered under col colonialist imperialist projects for the majority of their existence. And I think what all these nations now see is a chance to lift the jackboot of US, UK, EU imperialism from off their country. Um, that's why this war is more than about Ukraine. This is an existentialist war. Um, you know, for countries like Syria, where I live, for countries like uh, within uh, Africa that have been the target of resource plundering and neo-colonialism, for them, for Russia to push back against the West, to weaken the West, means for them the opening of new doors of opportunity, the chance of perhaps having a partnership with China or Russia that doesn't mean they're just completely subjugated economically, um, physically, militarily, in any way that the West sees fit, right? So I think for our African leaders, the response has been actually, you saw a pushback in Burkina Faso, for example, right? Almost immediately after the referendum, I think. So in a sense, it's energized these countries to push back against imperialism. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a pattern we're going to see um, materializing in the next few months. And of course, we're also seeing the West now pushing back against Iran, mm -hmm. pushing back against other countries that they perceive as potentially coming in as allies and in solidarity with Russia, because Iran has been supplying drones, of course, to Russia. And lo and behold, now we have potential regime change uh, uprisings um, in Iran. I mean, the pattern is so obvious. Yeah. 
Wyatt, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this too, because um, you, you're being American, you, you're seeing a lot of the rhetoric <laughs> about sanctioning, not just African nations, but other nations. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, the United States perceives any country, any move that could potentially threaten their hegemony and their grip on control over the world's resources and world's economy as a threat. And this is why you see their labeling of the decision by OPEC to cut oil production by 2 million barrels as a hostile act. Mm -hmm. It's somehow a hostile act for these countries to act in their own benefit. And that is more or less the mentality. And honestly, uh, I, I, I wanted to rather jump back to the previous question now that I, I kind of understand it a little better. Like the worst thing that I saw as a reporter uh, was probably in Bolivia when I went there during the coup d'etat after I um, helped uh, expose this, this coup d'etat in motion, I, I exposed this woman, Janice Bacadasa, who was serving as basically the tip of the spear in terms of legitimizing this coup before it happened, in terms of manufacturing consent for it, in terms of creating this concept that Evo Morales, the first indigenous president of Bolivia, was somehow a fake indigenous president who was actually some going against the interests of the indigenous people there um, for exposing this campaign by a woman named Janice Bacadasa, who is the great granddaughter of Bolivian dictator Larion Dasa. Um, I was uh, I was basically subjected to a massive campaign of bot attacks, something that has been replicated by the so-called NAFO uh, movement. These very clearly manufactured botnet attacks that even are going after people like Elon Musk now for daring to suggest these extraordinarily reasonable uh, proposals about maybe maybe the UN should step in and allow people to actually vote for their own future self determination. Um, it, when I came to Bolivia after having written about this, I, I was invited by by a colleague of mine who worked for the Telesur at the time. Uh, she basically said, you know, it would be great to have a, a gringo down here because it's an incredibly threatening situation. I think they would probably be a little bit less likely to attack me and put my life in jeopardy if there's some guy from the United States here. I said I would be more than happy to. I'd be thrilled to come down here. And I'd been um, at that moment when the coup kicked off, I'd been um, receiving tons of videos from people uh, who were looking out trying to find somebody who can show the truth of the situation so i went down there and i the day after i arrived witnessed the after effects of the sankata massacre and got to watch uh as bodies from indigenous protesters had been shot down uh mm -hmm. by this coup d'etat government uh <laughs> soldiers in helicopters gunning down not just protesters normal people walking to work in the wrong place at the wrong time mm -hmm. uh, and i got to record the after effects of this i went to the hospital uh where many of the bodies had been brought um there were no western journalists at all it was just me and this telester journalist and we uh, Camila Escalante, uh, Camila Escalante, if, if, if folks are interested, uh, she's on Twitter. Um, we were not allowed in, uh, and I'm, I want to mention, no Western journalists were covering this. I, I was outside with the mothers of these victims, many of whom were not even participating in these protests, as they were wailing, finding out that their only children, in many cases, have been removed from this earth the crime of having been in the wrong place at the wrong time we were not allowed into the hospital for over an hour and uh we were only allowed in when they had finished cleaning up all the blood off the floor this is something that i confirmed when i went in uh and went to the bathroom knocked on the door and uh, there was a woman who was cleaning in there and i asked her ya limpiaste toda la sangre and i said have you finished cleaning up all the blood and she said i'm just about there uh, she didn't realize who I was. And then when we spoke to the 
the head doctor, uh, you know, he had had an hour. He had been given time. He had clearly received instruction from the coup regime. He had been told, given a script, uh, and he said that there were a number of victims, XYZ, from XYZ injuries, uh, mm -hmm. certain people, wounds to the thorax, wounds to wherever. Um, but the most important point to note is that all of these people were victims of uh, small caliber arms, which is to say non-military grade weapons. And he said this very clearly, non-military grade weapons, mm -hmm. uh, which is an extraordinary claim to make, first of all, for a doctor who uh, served in the middle of nowhere, who had mm, nowhere near the amount of schooling that doctors, uh, you know, in, in greater place, you know, not greater places, but rather, you know, more developed countries would have expected, you know, it's, it's a different scale. Right. This doctor clearly didn't know what he's talking about. He's a not a trained forensic pathologist. He would have had no idea of knowing the specific caliber of the bullet that had been shot at these people. But yet he told us none of these people have been struck with military grade weapons. It was all part of a fraud of a sham of a farce that was being portrayed by the coup regime, the U.S. backed coup regime of Janine Añez at the time, uh, in order to portray these people as victims of themselves. They had simply shot themselves. Or in some cases, the narrative was that Cuban infiltrators had been brought in to murder down uh, demonstrated. That was my kind of first experience as a, a rebel journalist, as somebody who's going against the grain. Uh, and it was so clear that mm -hmm. this is bullshit. This is something right. that is being portrayed. This is a narrative that has been created and is now being disseminated by fascist techniques. I'm sure that man was forced. I, you know, I don't know whether or not he genuinely wanted to tell these lies. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine he had been threatened as well as a number of other uh, doctors, a number of other Officials that I spoke to later testified to me that they had been. Um, that to me was kind of the first demonstration that I had of really the power of the U.S. government in terms of creating and manipulating narratives. All the bot attacks by groups like CLS Strategies, a mm -hmm. yeah. Democrat loyalist uh, troll farm that right. uh, served to create all these fake accounts when that coup happened. You see all the same techniques being utilized now in terms of manufacturing consent for this proxy war, NATO's proxy war against Russia, which is clearly not in the interest of the United States people. It's clearly not interest in the people of Europe. And yet, nonetheless, all of these same forces persist in pushing us towards this potential nuclear war uh, because the threat of having somebody... Uh, take away this he hegemonic control that the U.S., that the U.K., that these transnational tiny group of elites controls, enjoys their control over uh, the, the concept that Russia could step in and say, you know what, enough is enough. We're not going to stand for this anymore. That right. the rest of the world could follow their lead after this. It's too much. And so now we are really at the cusp of of, of a new world being born. Right. And I think right. that's why you see so much anger, so much so much force, so much vitriol coming out finally to try to stop this. I don't think it's gonna work, but uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly hope not. And I'm sure that they will not stop until they are forced to do otherwise. Well, you know, on that note, I wanted to say, um, just in case our audience didn't know about the uh, details about the Bolivian coup, re reminder that besides the hostility that the U.S. government has towards Evo Morales, who is the president and indigenous, and the, and the political, um, which was socialist, and they have free medical care, and they have um, good education, and so on, they also have lithium which we need for batteries. And lithium was a great motivator for the West to be very interested in, in Bolivia. That's like a little side note. Um, you brought up nuclear war, as you know, last week, um, both of you, Joe Biden um, decided to uh, fundraise off the issue and talk about at his fundraiser how we've never been closer to nuclear war than in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis and went on. And so basically 
Um, what the U.S. government seems to be doing is doubling down on this concept that a limited nuclear war could actually happen and um, that, you know, that it could be impending, but of course, blaming it on Russia. Um, even after, obviously, for 20 years, NATO has been pushing on Russia's borders, and now we're fighting this proxy war. We've just committed $67 billion, another $12 billion um, was being earmarked, um, or 12 um, I'm losing track of billions and millions, but frankly, it's getting close to the total of $70 billion. And the whole military budget for US is at around 80 billion, which is obscene anyway, a year. So here we are with $1.5 million per citizen in the US of tax money going to Ukraine. They don't know where the money's going. And now the rhetoric is all around nuclear war. Could you both comment on that? Vanessa, I'll start with you. And, and in closing, any closing remarks you'd like to have for our audience with how they can reach you and whatnot. So Vanessa, you, you go and, and then we'll go to one. Well, yeah, I mean, I think first of all, you know, the billions of military aid that have gone into Ukraine, I think it's also worth pointing out that um, many of those weapons are falling into the hands of unknown combatants. Of the, they're being sold on the dark web. And of course, we saw this in Syria when the weapons that were for the so-called moderate rebels under Obama's train and equip miraculously ended up in the hands of ISIS that the U.S. was supposed to be fighting inside Syria. So, you know, we have to be raising questions about where these funds are going, where these weapons are going, and who is using them, right? Because most of these, most of the military in Ukraine from my understanding, are not trained in the use of HIMARS, for example. So in my opinion, it is actual NATO operatives that are using these weapons. So NATO is on the ground, although it is pushing Ukrainians forward as its proxy. I don't believe there is any way that, that the Ukrainian forces could have been trained in using the sophisticated weapons that are coming in. So it is NATO, that are, NATO uh, member states that are using them. Um, against Russian forces and against the DPR and LPR forces. That's my opinion. Um, <coughs> and of course, we have the foreign mercenaries on the ground also. As regards um, the threat of nuclear war, what I think is the most likely scenario, and we've seen uh, in Biden's latest statements, there is a kind of a um, an inkling that there is going to be a potential false flag. There is going to be a nuclear false flag and Russia will be blamed for it, okay, in order to escalate, in order to effectively even turn potentially Russia's allies against Russia because if Russia is perceived, just as Syria being perceived to have used chemical weapons against their own civilians, um, if Russia is perceived to have used nuclear weapons against Ukrainian civilians, then of course, you know, that, that and, and we're looking at much higher stakes in the war against Russia than we are in the war against Syria. So the false flags are going to be far more um, aggressive, far more dramatic, and far more damaging um, to the adversary, and the adversary in this case is Russia. So I would warn people to look out for this. Russia does not want nuclear war, they have made that perfectly clear. Even in Moscow, people were making it very clear to me, Russia does not perceive nuclear war as being the inevitable outcome, but they are afraid by the psychopaths that are in charge in the West. And, and you know, that is something, that's a very sobering thought, I think, to leave with people. So, yeah, just, to, to hop on, piggyback on that, there's only one country in world history that has ever used nuclear weapons. It's the United States of America. Bombed Hiroshima, bombed Nagasaki, not in order to cow Japan into defeat, but in order to send a message to the Soviet Union in the same sense that the United States did not go into West Berlin in order to defeat the Nazis. They went in to prevent the Soviet Union and the, from taking over more of Europe. <coughs> so what we what we hear when we when we are told that Putin threatened to use nuclear weapons, uh, what we really heard was a clarification and a repetition of 
the same policy that the Russian Federation has had for many years, which is that uh, while the Russian Federation does not have a no first strike policy, as the United States obviously does not either, what they do have is a policy of uh, never being willing to use nuclear weapons unless their territorial integrity, the sovereignty of their country is under threat. And in this case, a potential red line would be Crimea. Um, and so I think this is why you see the attacks from the Kiev regime on the Crimea bridge. This is why you see efforts, really, really hardcore attempts to uh, push through Kherson to potentially threaten Crimea, which is obviously a region that has historically for several hundred years felt an incredibly strong allegiance to Russia if this were threatened, and this is the statement that President Putin reiterated, if our territorial integrity and sovereignty is threatened, in this case through Crimea, we would be forced to act with whatever means are necessary. And of course, that could potentially include nuclear weapons. Um, and so obviously, this is a red line that the United States, the UK, NATO, the Ukrainian regime especially are attempting to push towards. Uh, and I think this is speculation, uh, but I, I would have to suspect that part of the reason that we have seen uh, these, these uh, intensification of the Russian military campaign today, especially with these massive cruise missile strikes against military and, and energy infrastructure throughout uh, territory controlled by the Kiev regime is that they are not willing to entertain any possibility that Kiev or their NATO backers are going to get anywhere near Crimea because they understand perfectly well that if they do, it would set the stage perfectly for a false flag, as, Manella, as Vanessa indicated, a false flag tactical nuclear strike, which could subsequently be blamed on Russia. They are taking this possibility off the table. That is kind of my reading of the situation. Obviously, I do not have any particular uh, speciality. I, I, I haven't been told anything personally by President Putin. That is my reading of the situation. Um, and just in terms of where people could find me, if you want to follow me on social media, I'm on Twitter at WyattReed13. You can find me on Telegram. Look up Wyatt Reed. That's kind of where I'm merging to because having been labeled Russia state affiliated media, uh, they are severely restricting my content. So I'm being censored and prevented from videos that I post on my Twitter account, get uh, almost more likes than views half the time, uh, 80 to 90% reduction in like, my ability to have people view my videos. So I'm kind of trying to migrate that direction um, we are being censored, we're being attacked, we're being labeled, put on hit lists. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll still be able to, to have some presence uh, in Western social media by the time all this is said and done. Uh, if not, I won't be terribly surprised, but I certainly hope so. And yeah, I want to give a shout out to you, Tara, and, and to Vanessa as well for having hopped on with me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I hope I get to hop on with you guys again sometime soon. I just, I'm, I'm so relieved you're okay, Wyatt. I got a little emotional right at the beginning because, you know, I just think you're this one of the sweetest people and, but also oh. just such a good investigative reporter. And I just, um, you know, just to think that your life was at risk for just doing your job. And Vanessa, the same with you. You've been in harm's way more than once and even recently. And again, I, I'm so relieved you're okay. Um, and, you know, you have my solidarity as far as lifting your work and continuing to follow you. And I'd like to have you both on my show again to give some updates um, and, and things, you know, work that you're doing. Because the more that we can lift each other, the more people we can reach with the truth which is why we're here in this space. And, you know, so thank you for everything, um, Vanessa, that you do and, and Wyatt that you do every single day. And um, to my listeners and audience members that are viewing, uh, thank you so much. You can follow their work. We have the links down below the chat. Um, and so you can follow Vanessa and Wyatt. Please like and subscribe to um, this channel. Um, right now we're on YouTube okay, but you know how that goes. So you can always find us <laughs> Rumble and Rockland. So there you have it. 
um, so there you have it, everyone. Let's hope for peace and um, a multipolar world that can um, work more on innovation and partnership and cooperation rather than have to discuss um, lives being lost and um, hearts being broken. Um, so with that, I will see you next time. Take care, everyone.